Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of Apocalypse Anonymous, the world's first and largest support club for addicts of dystopian literature. My name is Jennifer, and for the past 18 years, I've struggled with an incurable love for fictional depictions of Doomsday. I'm hooked on Huxley, addicted to Atwood, constantly craving Cormac McCarthy. And if you've been following the trends of popular literature for the past few years, chances are you're just as familiar with these names as I am. Since the genre first began to coalesce at around the turn of the 20th century, the book market has become truly saturated with versions of these books. Just think of the massive popularity of things like The Handmaid's Tale, The Road, or even more notorious examples in the world of YA pulp fiction like the Divergence series or The Hunger Games. There's no denying that we really have a voracious appetite for Armageddon. In fact, if you're ever feeling a little bit nihilistic, here's what you can do. Head down to our local Blackwells, go to the speculative fiction section, pick up some books, flip through some pages, and you can see the world end in a hundred different ways, from war to disease to nuclear holocaust. But all of this begs the question, why exactly are we so drawn to this genre? There's no need to point out to you, I'm sure, that right now we're living through a period of mass chaos and curtailed civil liberties that itself feels like it's ripped out of the pages of some horrible dystopian novel. So surely right now we need something light and warm. We need something that's going to fill us with hope and buoy up our spirits. Surely we need the opposite of dystopia, right? Well, maybe not. Because what I'm hopefully going to be showing you today is why our collective hunger for dystopian literature could be a good thing. Because as it turns out, a broken view of the world might be the clearest. And reading about dysfunctional societies may help us build a better one. But then again, there's something terribly wrong with the last sentence I just said. I said the words reading about dysfunctional societies as if ours is perfectly normal, as if the prospect of dysfunction is something that only exists within the pages of books. And that's a really common misconception, because when we hear the word dystopia, nine times out of ten, it's followed by the word novel, or the word literature, or the word fiction. And don't get me wrong, I'm totally guilty of this. In fact, it happens in the title of my talk. But my point is, we hear the word dystopia used in conjunction with works of fiction so often that we've come to think of it as automatically synonymous with make-believe. But that assumption is just as dangerous as it is untrue. Take a look at this slide. Sorry, I know, this probably takes most of you right back to GCSE. Doublethink is a term from Orwell's 1984. It's a tool used by the fascist government Ingsoc to get its citizens to blindly accept whatever ridiculous propaganda they choose to feed them. 1984 is one of the most widely studied classroom texts in the world, and with all due respect to my high school English teachers, it's also an objectively terrible choice for a classroom novel. Why? Well, because when you learn this book in a classroom setting, you learn to hold it at this cool, intellectual distance. It becomes a great work about some place over there, a bleak but distant concept that you don't ever really have to contemplate in any form more tangible than an exam paper or an essay prompt. Doublethink becomes, like the pages of a book, two-dimensional. Scary? Sure. But too abstract and extreme ever to be real. And then something like this happens on the news. That's Kellyanne Conway, the senior counselor to President Trump from 2017 to 2020. Now, as you might know, that little clip we just watched became one of the most widely circulated internet memes of the year. Pictures, posts, tweets, all appeared slamming the seeming absurdity of Ms. Conway's language, but maybe you too picked up on the literary echo behind those words. Alternative facts, contradicting beliefs. Sean Spicer did not lie, accepting both beliefs at once. And this trend of disturbing real-world literary parallels continues. Take a look at this particularly gory quote from The Hunger Games. And now watch this clip from Survivor. Read this extract from Kazuo Ishiguro's fantastic novel, Never Let Me Go, which is about children cloned to be organ donors. And then compare it with this headline from June last year. Now I wonder, if I remove those labels at the top of the page, 
how many of us would be able to tell which world is ours and which one is make-believe? So the next time you hear the word dystopia, the question I want you to ask yourself isn't, is this fiction? Instead, is this. Why do these circumstances only horrify us when they're presented to us as fiction? Why do the things we encounter every single day in ordinary life, the things we joke about on the internet, that we watch on TV, that we dismiss, accept as normal, why does putting them inside the pages of a book make them feel perversely more real and more terrifying? Last year, I read this novel by Naomi Alderman called The Power. Some of you might have heard of it. It's based on this almost farcical premise about a world where women suddenly develop the ability to electrocute men. As you can imagine, it goes pretty rapidly downhill from there. It's used to impose matriarchal oppression, to force men into unwanted relationships, and so on and so forth. And I read it as a bit of outlandish fun. Until I stumbled upon this interview with the author, Alderman, where she points out that nothing ever happens to a man in the book that's not already happening to a woman in our world today. The truth is, dystopian fiction is a diagnosis. The same way that a doctor might take an x-ray, authors like Collins, like Alderman, like Ishiguro, they take an aspect of our world and they exaggerate it to extreme proportions, they zoom in on it. And only through these means, in this medium, can we realize that we are ill. And dystopian fiction isn't just a diagnosis, it's also a prognosis, a prediction of which way the disease will turn next. They let us see what would happen in 10, 50, 10,000 years time if we let our current problems spiral out of control. In this way, we can kind of think of them as experiments in miniature, like those bacterial agar dishes that scientists use to observe accelerated processes of evolution. We take this artificial fertile medium, like literature, we input the conditions of our current society with all of its problems, its flaws and prejudices, and we watch them grow into something monstrous, something distorted. I talked before about how dystopian fiction can help us identify the symptoms of an ailing society. Well, if those are the symptoms, then this is the forecast of the disease's development. And if we're smart, we'll use them to prevent as well as predict. Let's not pull an Orwell here. Let's not use these books as instruction manuals instead of warnings. The prophecies they lay out haven't come true yet. And that's the important part. Whether or not they will come true is completely up to us. So far, I've talked about this genre of book as a kind of interesting thought experiment, something with hypothetical value, but there's an abundance of evidence that it actually shapes our actions in the real world as well. Huffington Post found in a study that consumption of dystopian narratives makes people more inclined to radical political action, makes them more sympathetic to dissenting views, even more than watching real footage from actual protests. And in fact, we don't need to confine ourselves to the laboratory setting. Think about how two years ago, The Handmaid's Tale became an international protest symbol, with women all over the world donning scarlet cloaks and white hoods to protest abortion rights. The fact is, these books give us the courage to act, and they also give us something else as well. Dystopian fiction, with all of its grimness, its death and destruction, dystopian fiction can actually give us hope. The hope of humanity emerging from the rubble. The hope of brave citizens rising up against unjust governance. The hope of salvage despite ruin. And that brings me to the last book I want to mention today, which is Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven. And that's a particularly apt book for these times, I think, because Station Eleven's world is one that ends in plague. A mysterious disease starts in Georgia. Countries predictably turn on each other as it spreads across the globe, and we end up with civilization in smoking ruins as societal order breaks down. But all of that happens before the book's main plot even begins. Because Station Eleven isn't a book about destruction. Station Eleven is a book about rebirth. We see vegetable gardens flourishing in reclaimed parking lots. We see little villages springing up in abandoned airports. We see performances of Shakespeare held amongst the beams of fallen skyscrapers. And that's important because there are those among us who I'm sure are more cynical readers who want to point out the endings to books are hardly ever realistic. There's no way that one man can cure the plague or overthrow the tyranny or avert Armageddon. But what Station Eleven shows us is that dystopian literature isn't all about unrealistic promises of total salvation. It's about salvation despite ruin. 
It's about beauty in the wake of devastation. And it's about remembering that if we're in dark days, as dark as the ones we're living through right now, it's because we haven't yet reached the final page. So, hi everyone, my name is Jennifer and welcome back to this meeting of Apocalypse Anonymous. I regret to inform you that today will actually be the last time we gather as an association, because as it turns out, our love of dystopian literature isn't an addiction we need to be cured of. It's the cure itself. It's a tool that helps us parse through the present and predict the future, and it's a call to arms, inspiring us to take action to shape a better world. Dystopia, perversely, can be the tool that leads us back to utopia. Thank you.